All right. Let's get started. All right. Um, so, midterm is coming up. Uh, there will be midterm review sessions uh, sometime next week, probably Monday night. We're in the process of scheduling them Monday night and Tuesday night, and um, or there might it'll be either one of them or both of them. We're not quite certain yet. Um, and today what I'm going to continue talking about is the frequency response material that Professor Broderson has been covering in class the past week. So, um, hopefully by now all of you are familiar with Bode plots. Professor Broderson covered them in great detail. Uh, how is the general comfort level with Bode plots? High, low? What? Hi, we're, we're, we're good with them? Okay, good. That's good to hear. Um, I'll run through one or two just to make things really super clear. So with regards to Bode plots, or with regards to basically anything uh, in terms of frequency response, whatever, dot, 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 um, the thing to keep in mind is capacitances are just impedances. So if you were to see something like this, some bias voltage. If you were to see something like this, where basically you've got some transistor and it's in some known configuration and someone said, what's the, what's the Z out looking into the, the, the drain of this transistor? Um, you know, you say, oh man, there's a, there's a, there's a capacitor there. Uh, things are tricky to figure out. It's like all different. It's all new. But realistically, this is no different from just the generic, let's replace that with Z1, let's call it C1. And we know that Z out of this is equal to RO plus Z1 plus GM RO Z1, right? We know that. I mean, if this were, if Z1 were a resistor, it'd be really straightforward, and you'd basically say it's roughly equal to uh, GM R out, and then whatever that resistance is, Z1. So the fact that you have a capacitor or even an inductor um, is nothing to be, is nothing to sort of, make you feel overwhelmed or um, apprehensive. You know, the only thing to keep in mind is that once you do this, well, so what do we have? We have to, uh, so we know that Z out is equal to, roughly equal to GM RO times Z1, right? I'll, I'll actually, I'll do the full expression plus R out plus Z1. What is Z1? Z1 is, is the impedance of a capacitor, right? What's the impedance of a capacitor? 1 over J omega C1. So Z out of something like this is equal to GM R out over J omega C1 plus R out plus 1 over J omega C1. So... GM R out plus 1 over J omega C1 plus R out. And I didn't do anything, I, I haven't taught you anything new. You already know what the, the impedance of a capacitor is, and you already know what the output impedance of a source generated transistor is. And just making the connection that, oh, okay, this impedance is no longer purely resistive. It's imaginary and it's frequency dependent. 
who cares? It's still the same basic um, the same basic uh, analysis. Okay. So and that's what's done. Does everyone does everyone understand what I went through here? Yeah? Good. Good. So that's what's done all the time when Professor Broderson was actually doing his Bode plots. Is he was basically taking a topology that generally speaking looked like this. Sure. Use a microphone, please. Okay, use another microphone. Um, no. All right, fine. You tried to. Should he still use the microphone even if it doesn't go to those speakers? Yes. yes. Okay. So everyone can hear you. Uh, in the in the previous slides, like we we like uh we take out a one one like over j j omega c one turn because that's a small right. But like for other people. Wait, other who took? I didn't take that out. I did the full expression. Yeah, oh, 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 no, oh, 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 what I did here is it's, it was GMRO over J omega C1 plus RO plus 1 over J omega C1. I just grouped this term in here, so I added the plus 1 there. That. So I didn't make any simplifications here. So, like, uh, like in other situations, can we, like, I mean, like, how can we do some, like, kind of numerical comparison between, like, the impedance of the... The capacitor and then like the that's a know. fantastic question okay that is an absolutely fantastic question and that's sort of what Bode plots are showing you okay because and 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 I'll use the, the simple canonical example to explain my point and then we can come back to this expression okay so anyways going back with the with the standard Bode plots the, we typically have a very simple network something like this where you have two no voltage nodes that are being applied and you have an output node and in between each you have two devices that have either impedance ZA or you know 1 over ZA equals YA and depending on how you want to do the calculation sometimes it's easier to work with impedances as opposed to admittances but hopefully all of you are familiar that you know Z equals 1 over Y okay so from this expression we can simply calculate that V out equals VA times ZB over ZA plus ZB plus VB times ZA over ZA plus ZB. This is simply um, a voltage divider, but I'm looking at it from both sides and then linear, linearly superimposing the two results. So when we have the really, really simple network of this, RC. This is just a sp and VA, V out. This is just a specific example of this where VI is equal to VA, right? VB is the voltage applied on this other side. That's equal to zero. ZA is R. And, oops. This is supposed to say ZBYB. Okay. ZB is equal to 1 over J omega C. Okay. So plugging that in and using stuff that you learned in, I don't know what course it's called here, probably EE40, -E it's just a resistive divider. And so, boop, boop, boop. So VO equals VA becomes VI, ZB becomes R, oops, ZA, excuse me, ZB is 1 over J omega C, ZA is R, plus 1 over J omega C, plus VB is 0, so we'll ignore the rest of that, and we'll do a, uh, a little bit of algebraic manipulation, and we get V out equals VI, times 1 over 1 plus J omega C R. Okay? So, H of S 
H of J omega, which is defined as V out over VI, is equal to 1 over 1 plus J omega CR. Okay? For this particular example. And the question was asked, well, and it was in regards to the previous example, um, you know, how do we know, how do we do numerical analysis to figure out whether or not the R or the C is bigger? And basically, um, it's not that the R or C is bigger, that the impedance of the R versus the impedance of the C is bigger. And it basically falls out to this equation. Okay? So what we can see is that this is a resistive divider. If the impedance of the resistor is smaller than the impedance of the capacitor, then most of the voltage gets through. If the impedance of the resistor is much bigger than the impedance of the capacitor, then very little of the voltage gets through. Okay? So, when we take this and do a Bode plot, which you all should be familiar with now, and I'm putting it on a log scale, log of the absolute value of H of J omega, and log of omega, it looks something like this. Okay? And in the low frequency region, the transfer function, now this is 1 or 0 dB, call it what you want to call it. Um, in the low frequency region, we see that <coughs> most of the voltage gets transferred through. So therefore, intuitively, we know that the impedance of R must be less than the impedance of C. Okay? Does that make sense to everyone? Good. In this region, we can see up, as we increase frequency, we're getting less and less of the voltage through. Therefore, the impedance of C must be smaller than the impedance of R, and as we increase frequency, it continues that ratio. It gets even much, much, much smaller than R. Okay? And where's the breakpoint? 1 over RC. Miraculously, ZA for omega equals 1 over RC, what is it equal to? It's equal to R. ZB for omega equals 1 over RC is equal to 1 over J omega C is equal to 1 over J 1 over R. C times C, the C's cancel, so you end up getting R over J. So at this breakpoint, the, the, the magnitudes of the impedances, obviously there's a, the ZB is purely imaginary, and ZA is purely real, the impedances are equal. And so that's, sort of, that's almost why that 3 dB point matters so much, or why it's so relevant. It's because it's right at the point where the two impedances are equal. Okay? So, three. And so we can go back and look at, this is pa back to page one that I had, I had started writing on before. And so you would ask for this example, for this example where we have capacitive, basically capacitive degeneration, we have the expression that Z out is equal to GM RO plus 1 over J omega C1 plus RO. Okay? We can, we can actually plot the Bode plot of that. Okay? So, well, the first question is, when are these two equal? At omega, omega equality. Well, we do the math, we get, so we want to see, it's really omega equality, so that the absolute value of, the, of this guy, of the imaginary part, equals the absolute value of the real part. So the absolute value of Z imaginary equals the absolute value of Z real at omega equality. So therefore, the left side of the equation is GM R out plus 1 over omega equality times C. And then the real part is RO. So therefore, that omega equality is equal to GM R out 
plus 1 over R0 times C. Does everyone see that? Okay. So now, once we have this and we have this, we don't even really need to do much more math. We can apply our intuition about Bode plots to get log of abs of z versus log of omega. And we know that at this point, omega equality, that there's going to be some kind of break point because that's the equality point. That's where one guy takes over versus the other guy takes over. So the question is, as omega goes to infinity, what does z out go to? Who can tell me? All right. Okay. So at high frequency, we know, at very high frequency, we know that we're going to have, it's going to be cut, the resistance going to, the log of z is going to be constant and R up. So therefore, it's going to do something like this. Okay. At very low frequency, what is um, law, what is the absolute value of z out going to be? Which term is going to be bigger? The imaginary term or the real term? Imaginary. So it's going to be, so omega goes to zero, z out is going to be gm ro plus 1 over omega c. So that means it's going to be a curve that has a slope of minus 1. And it's going to get bigger as we go lower in frequency. So basically, I kind of gave it away, is that it's going to look like this. I didn't really do any more math, but just by sort of looking at the various components of the expression of z out, we can construct the Bode plot. Yeah? What does omega equality relate to the 3dB uh, frequency of the, uh, the two? Good question. Okay. So, and, and I, I, sort of, I sort of jumped ahead and said, the equality point is the 3dB without sort of showing you why that's the case, right? Okay. So, five. So what does omega 3dB mean? It means, depending on whether it's plus 3dB or minus 3dB case, it means that, let's assume it's so, so plus 3dB, because that's what we're talking about here, right? Because it, it starts flat, or it's flat and then it goes up. So at this point, it's actually 3dB higher, okay? So at omega plus 3dB, it means that the absolute value, the magnitude of z out is, is 3 dB higher, in this case, than z out of omega goes to infinity. Okay, what does 3 dB higher mean? 3 dB higher means root 2. So, z out at omega plus 3 dB, at the omega plus 3 dB point is equal to the square root of 2 times z out infinity. Okay? And people always get very confused as to whether or not you're talking about, is it, is, should this be a root 2 or a 2? And the issue comes down to whether or not you're talking about squared amplitudes, like squared magnitudes, or just magnitudes. So when you're talking about voltages, here we're talking about impedances, so it's not quite clear. But if we're talking about voltages, it's talk whether or not you're talking about volts or volts squared. Because volts squared relates to power, and so it me the 3 dB point is 2 times the power versus root 2 times the amplitude. Okay, so let's figure out where Z out equals root 2 times z out infinity, which is R up. Okay? So I'll rewrite the expression. z out here is equal to gm R o plus 1 over j omega c1 plus R o. Okay? And more generally, 
it's equal to RO plus, well, okay. So the magnitude of Z out, right, is equal to this squared plus this squared, square root of 2, okay? So that root 2 condition is held when this term equals that term, right? So when you have basically r out squared plus r out squared, right? Okay, and therefore what that means is that this term, the magnitude of this that condition will be held when the magnitude of this term equals the magnitude of that term, which is that omega equality that I had already defined. Okay? Does everyone get that? Are there any other questions about that? So yeah, it's there are a lot of reasons why that the omega 3 dB point kind of has some intrinsic physical meaning to what's going on, as well as being a useful metric. And I guess that's sort of the point. Yeah. Where did the uh, root 2 go? I mean, you're equating those. So if, if z out, if we end up finding the case where z out equals r out squared plus r out squared, that's equal to root 2 r out, which is exactly the condition that we had stated up top. OK? All right, so that's I mean, what, I'm, what I'm trying to motivate here is that at first capacitors, like, they kind of scare you. They're like, oh, no, it's a whole other set of tools. It's not. That's the basic point. Like, um, putting a capacitor in there just means that you're dealing with impedances, and the impedances happen to be complex. So, yeah, everyone's learned complex numbers already, so that, that, that shouldn't be a problem. Okay? What next? Let me look at my notes for a second. So, you know, we can go through some exercises of, like, you know, putting down a network and calculate and, and, and figuring out what the transfer function is and what the Bode plot looks like. Um, is that some, by a show of hands, who would like me to do that? The other choice is um, one thing I want to tell you about are the various sources of capacitances in your MOS device. And I guess if we have time afterwards, I can also talk a little bit about, like, take general questions about the midterm. So any preferences? Wow. OK. A really boisterous crowd. I figured, yeah, okay, we can talk about the midterm. But first, I do want to cover some of the basic material for um, Bode plots and frequency analysis, because that is important for the homework. By the way, the homework has been handed out, posted. It's due in two weeks. So, like, it's not due the week of the midterm. Um, we may give you a short extension as well. Probably, It will probably be due two weeks from today. As opposed to two weeks from when, as as opposed to the Wednesday prior to that, um, and uh, it covers frequency response, so it's it's useful to cover this. And so some some very important material for um, uh, for the homework is talking about the device, you know, an MOS device and the intrinsic capacitances. So capacitances of MOS device. So I'll talk about that for around 10 minutes, and then I'll take, oops, cap, I misspelled capacitance, but you know what I'm talking about. So we've got our device here. Gate, source, drain, and bulk. OK. And so we already know the small signal model with GM, with R out, with GMB, and so on and so forth. But there are, now that we're talking about frequency response, there are other, there are other components that are present in the small signal model that we need to consider. OK? First and foremost 
is CGS, which, unsurprisingly, is the capacitance between gate and source. Okay? And, um, let me see. So, the thing to keep in mind is that for an MOS device, and I'll, here I'm drawing, you know, source, drain, here's the gate, and the gate is actually a three-dimensional device, and the Here's the gate, okay. So the gate floats above the channel, and there's some spacing, which is T ox. And that's the that's the thin oxide between the gate node and the channel. And it, and and that device is very thin. So what you can see is that you've got this parallel plate capacitance between the gate and the source. It's not the gate and the source, the gate and the channel. Okay? And typically when the, when the, and so this capacitance is WL C ox, where C ox is equal to E ox over T ox. And you've used these expressions quite a bit in your homeworks, I believe. Yeah, because we give you device models in terms of T ox, and you have to calculate what C ox is for the, you know, mu, mu zero C ox. So in saturation, due to the channel charge distribution, and this is stuff that's discussed in the EE130, and I won't go into depth on it, I will merely state that CGS is equal to two-thirds W L C ox. Okay, and the two-thirds is due to the fact that uh, the, the, gate is, the gate is communicating with the source through this capacitance. And due to the channel charge distribution, it just ends up, you can calculate it out to be roughly two-thirds, okay? So that's one source of capacitance. There's also another source of capacitance, which is due to the fact that, and I didn't really draw it here, but on this model, so this is W, this is L, okay? So now I'll just draw the straight 2D version of this. Due to the etching um, and and uh, the process, uh, the, the 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 device fabrication process, there's some overlap between the gate and the source here, and so you've got some direct capacitance there, okay? And that capacitance, it will the total capacitance there will be directly proportional to the width because you'll have some overlap here that goes back, and, and then you've got your width here. So you've got W times a process parameter called CGSO. It's the overlap capacitance from gate to source. Okay? And these pr parameters, COX, CGSO, will be defined in um, any kind of process deck that you get, any kind of spice deck that you get. Okay? CGD, basically the gate, due to, this, due to the fact that you're in saturation, the gate and the drain don't really communicate quite as much, but you've still got that overlap. So you've got W times C, G, D, zero. It's overlap. Okay? So now, I'll, I'll come back to this page in just a second. I'm going to draw a top view of a device. So this is the gate. This is L, this is W, actually, this portion inside here is W. This is the source, this is the drain, okay? The gate, and out here, this region out here is the bulk, okay? The gate electrode, the gate node, overhangs the edge of the source drain diffusion region, some amount here, okay? And so again, you've got some overlap capacitance from the gate to the bulk. And so the amount, so, and you can see that as L gets bigger, the amount of area that overlaps from the gate to the bulk also gets bigger. So therefore, CGB is equal to the length times CGB overlap. Okay? From this. 
And then finally, there are two other capacitances, and that's from the source to the bulk and the drain to the bulk. And they're of an identical type, so I'll just show you for one. So basically, um, and we'll kind of need two pictures here. This, I, I'm kind of drawing it down. Nah. This is a, uh, so in an NMOS device, this is an N plus region and this is a P region. So you've got a diode. You've got a, you've got a, you've got a PN diode from the drain to the bulk. And it's reversed biased. But there will still be some capacitance associated with that. So the capacitance, C, like DB, is equal to the area capacitance, the area cap, times the area. In other words, the area capacitive density, plus the perimeter cap, because it is this, it's this three-dimensional device. So you've got the bottom plate area as well as uh, the perimeter around the, basically the sidewall times the perimeter. Okay? And so let's figure out what the area and perimeter is first. The area is equal to W times this distance. This distance is set by the process, and due to old scaling rules, old design rules, this is equal to a value four times lambda, typically where the gate is two times lambda. Now, this lambda is different from the lambda in the small signal model. This lambda is the, is the, scalable, is the minimum feature size. So it might be something like in a 0.25 micron process, this lambda might be 0 0.125 micron or something like that. So there are two. So now there's another lambda here. This one has units of length. Okay. So the area is W times four lambda, and the perimeter is the perimeter of these three sides. So it's W plus eight lambda for the perimeter. Okay. And the formula for the uh, for the area cap density is given as Cj, which is some process parameter, one plus V B S over P B. Okay, Cj. This is a process parameter. Mj. That's also a process parameter. VBS is the voltage from bulk to source. And phi B uh, is another process parameter. Okay? And so similarly for the perimeter cap, you've got CJSW, which stands for the junction. CJ is junction capacitance. SW is sidewall. Over 1 plus VBS over PB, MJSW. So... Let me write this full expression out for uh, the, the, the drain bulk or the source bulk capacitance. So C source bulk equals area, which is W times 4 lambda times the uh, capacitance of the area. Cj, the capacitive density, 1 plus Vbs over phi b to the mj plus the perimeter, which is W plus 8 lambda times CJSW over 1 plus VBS phi B MJSW. Okay. So that's the capacitance for the source bulk and the, the drain bulk is identical, but obviously with... Um, with different, um, whatchamacallit, with different drain instead of source. And one final note is that MJ typically equals 0 0.5, and MJSW typically equals one third. So if, if it's not explicitly stated, that's what you should assume. And, t and all these process parameters are typically given in a process stack. Okay. So there are a lot of extra capacitances to be drawn in your small signal model. You know, so what you've got is you've got capacitances basically almost from every node to every node.
and then so this is the gate, the source, the drain, the bulk. The thing to keep in mind is that typically the bulk is attached to ground. So it's not so you can lump a lot of capacitors together. Okay? So if you've got you know an NMOS device connected to ground, CSB doesn't matter, right? Because it's because you're doing that. The drain bulk is just a capacitance to ground. The gate source is just a capacitance to ground. The gate drain is, an, is, is actually the only sort of interesting capacitance, where it's not where it's from two signal nodes, from one signal node to another. Okay. So, any questions on uh, device capacitances? Did I sort of throw way too much information at you in a short amount of time? All right. Well, I'll assume that you, if you don't say anything, I'll assume that you are following along just fine. So anyway, so that's that's the material that I really wanted to cover um, in this week's section. We have some time, and I can sort of take general questions about the midterm. If you want me to run through a sample problem that won't take too long, I can do that too. I haven't prepared any specific midterm review questions for this section because uh, we will have some form of midterm review early next week. So, any questions? Let me open it up. Yeah. Um, can you cover either the telescopic op amp or the break frequency jumping stuff? What was the second thing you said? Break frequencies. Break? No, sorry. Yeah. Break points. Sorry. Break points? Yeah, okay. In the homework. Sure. Or. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So break points. So let's assume, just to keep things simple, VB1, VB2, VB3, V out, V in. Okay. This is a standard single ended telescopic op amp. I chose not to draw uh, a, a differential op amp just because it takes less time to look at this, and the fundamental concepts are the same. So everyone should know that basically the vol the, the 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 voltage gain uh, of this, presuming that everything um, is in saturation, is roughly proportional to GM R out squared, right? You know, realistically. So M1, M2, M3, M4. Big GM is equal to GM1. Then R out is equal to RO up parallel RO down. OK. RO down is equal to R out 2 plus R out 1 plus GM2 R out 2 R out 1. R out up is equal to R out 3 plus R out 4 plus GM3 RO3 RO4. This should all be basically second nature to all of you by now. A lot of the times I will be sloppy and I think that realistically most of the time you, you all can be sloppy as well and kind of ignore that, those first two terms because this is the dominant term. So basically you put that all in together and you get roughly GMR out squared. You know, but you can expand out the math yourself. Now the question is, well, What's the swing of this? And sort of breakpoints is talking about swing. It's like, at what point does the out will the output hit a voltage such that one of the devices is no longer in saturation, it goes into triode, and as a result, your gain drops. Triode devices, you should actually do the math just to understand what's going on, but triode devices have a much le lower effective GMR out than saturation mode devices have. Um, 
and you can do the math yourself. And you can also you can actually also see it from the fact that so if this is VDS and this is ID, the large signal that it, that you know MOS curves look like this, right? And so R out is equal to one over DID DVDS. So in other words, the slope of the, one over the slope of this curve. Out in this region, the slope is very small, which means R out is very large. In this region, the slope is very high, which means that R out is very small. So getting back here, okay. So assuming all this stuff is set up such that V uh, all these devices are in saturation. Let's and let's assume V out starts going down. Okay, so we've got M1, M2, M3, M4. What's the first device that's going to become unhappy? M2, exactly, because well, clearly it's not going to be M3 or M4, right? The the, the question is why isn't it M1? Why is it M2 and not M1? Anyone know? Yeah. Well, why do we know that M2 is going to go to linear before M1 does? Yeah. Yeah. So basically what happens is that, you know, these devices, well, another way of putting it is that these devices don't communicate very well from drain to source. So if you just look at these bottom two devices here, and this is a bias node. This node here is basically a source follower from VB1. So while this device is in saturation, this node isn't going to change very much. Okay. So as a result, this volt M1 is not going to get squeezed, and M2 will. Okay. So uh, at what voltage will voltage of crush crushing two? What voltage is that? V out equals what? Exactly. Equals VB1 minus, excuse me, yeah, I called this VB1, although I should call it VB2, but whatever, you understand, minus V threshold. And the, how he got there was that VDS2 at the crush point is equal to VDSAT2, okay? So that means that. So to go from here to here, hold on, let me, so VD equals VS plus VD sat. VS equals VG minus VT minus VD sat. So you plug this in, the VD sats cancel, and you get basically VD equals VG minus VT. The VG is VB1, VT is VT. So that's the voltage at which this top device gets crushed. Okay? So then what we have to do next is also going down, figure out, so M2 is going to get crushed. Clearly the next M2 is going to get crushed. Clearly the next device will be M1, right? So, um, I actually haven't done the math on this. Okay. So we know that this, so, so what do we know, at what point, this is VB1, this guy's in triode now. Okay. So, what at what 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 do we need what do we know is going to happen, or what condition needs to be met in order to keep this guy in saturation, generally speaking, not in terms of V out. We know that V D this this node let's call this V D, V D when V D equals V D sat, that's the break point V D sat one, okay. So what we can do is if we want to be sloppy. A first order approximate is that when this guy is in triode, VDS is very small. So therefore, when V out approximately equals VD sat one is the other breakpoint. 
Now, depending on your process parameters, that is not true because if there's current flowing through this, then there's current flowing through this. So this guy will still have some residual VDS. So to really rigorously solve this, what you'd have to say is we know we basically know what the bias current of this guy is. Okay? So then we can figure out, given V out and VB, V out and VB1, we know that the current in a in a triode device is equal to K W over L VGS minus VT minus VDS over 2 times VDS, right? So we know that has to equal IB. So IB equals that. VGS is VB1 minus VD, which is VD sat 1, minus VT. And VDS is V out. VDS is equal to V out minus VD, which is VD sat 1. So everything is known except for, so the math would be V out minus VD sat 1 over 2 times V out minus VD sat 1. So that's, that's the equation that you need to solve. The only unknown in here is V out. IB is known, KWL is known, VB1 is known, VD sat is known. So you end up having a, 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 a effectively a quadratic equation uh, in, um, in V0. And another approximation that you might be able to make is if you assume that VDS of this is small, then you can kind of ignore that. And just then you have a linear equation in V out, which is a little easier to solve. I don't know if a question like this is going to be asked on the midterm. Um, I've done the questions that I am responsible for, and uh, I haven't asked about swing. Other like we're each making different questions. A question like this might be asked on the midterm. I simply don't know. But you know, if you make, you know, you, you need to figure out whether or not you can make approximations, or if you have to formulate a quadratic equation. And then just you know plug in the quadratic formula to to, to get the, the the voltages. I assume so. If numeric numbers are allowed, um, that's a very you know Professor Broderson is the ultimate arbiter of exam policy, so um, I would ask him that on Monday because like whatever I say, you can take and believe, but I'm not the one who makes that decision. Okay. Other questions. So that's that's kind of how you do swing on something like this, this kind of question, and you can do the same thing going up as well. And so those are those are kind of the breakpoints. Yeah. Oh, with the diff amp. Um, yes. Yes. Okay. So so let's look at let's look at a diff pair. We don't need it doesn't need to be cast coded. Okay. So V I P V I N and who knows what's going on upstairs? But in terms of, so, so if you're just doing common mode stuff, this is pretty easy um, in terms of figuring out. Actually, you know what? I'm going to start this over. I'm going to draw a full diff amp. And I apologize that you all have to rewrite stuff. And I actually think I sort of did this, this kind of question in section not so long ago. Yeah, I see plus VID over 2, VIC minus VID over 2, V out. Okay. Yeah, I did this with regards to the project. But I can I can do it I can do this kind of question again. Do people want me to do this again in terms of like what kind of input common mode swing this can tolerate? Okay, I've seen enough people shaking their head yes. FYI, it's a couple minutes to 12. I can go on a little later, but if any of you need to go, feel free to walk out.
Um, okay, so we're just doing common mode. Don't worry about it. Go after section. I am picking up the homeworks. <laughs> Very sneaky. I know. So, okay. So as VIC goes up and down, let's figure out what happens. Easy one is when VIC goes down. Okay? So this is M1, M0. These guys are M2. Okay. As VIC goes down, what's the, what's the bad thing that's going to happen? What's, what device is going get, to get crushed? M0. Right. And basically what we can figure out is that this node is going to be VIC minus VT1 minus VDSAT1. And once that's less than VDSAT0, this device will be crushed. Right? And I wrote that real small, so I'll write it again big. VIC minus VT1 minus VDSAT1. When that equals VDSAT0, that's the crush point, down. So going down, going up. When we go up, what's going to happen? Which device is going to get crushed? <coughs> this is a bit trickier to figure out. Yes, M1. Which one, the left one or the right one? Well, actually both. Um, because we're doing common mode, because this is purely common mode, this voltage is equal to that voltage. Okay? So this voltage here is going to be VDD minus VT2 minus VDSAT2. Right? And so that voltage, so that needs to be, so VDD minus VT2 minus VDSAT2. That voltage needs to be the source voltage of M1, this common source, needs to be a VDSAT greater, VDSAT1 greater than the source of this voltage. In other words, you need VDSAT1 across here. So minus VDSAT1 when that equals V common source. Okay? then you, you hit the crush point. What is V common source? V common source is simply VIC minus VT minus VDSAT1. So it turns out that the VDSATs end up canceling out VDSAT1. So you end up getting, unless I did my math wrong, minus VT2 minus VDSAT2 plus VT1 equals VIC. That's the upward crush point. Okay? So, that's your input common mode swing. And something just to keep in mind is that typically with differential amplifiers, um, the, in, the common mode gain, as you've learned, is very low. So you typically talk about what kind of common mode input swing you can support because you change the input common mode, the output's not going to the, the output's not going to change very much. So it's kind of meaningless to talk about the output common mode swing. But with diff in, but these amplifiers in the differential mode are going to have a very large differential gain. So the output's going to swing when the input swings very little. So it's not really meaningful to talk about the input differential swing. It's meaningful to talk about the output differential mode swing. So when you're talking about these crush points, we're kind of cha I'm kind of changing whether or not I'm talking about input versus output, but there's reason for that. All right. Yeah. You know what? Let's take a two-minute break so that people who want to leave can go. Okay? Homework four? Yes. Thank you. Homework four? So is this what I did was I found the max that this 
node can be. Mm-hmm. Uh, by going down the VD set, like two VD set. Okay. T, and then minus another VD set. Uh-huh. And then what I did was then I subtracted off this V source two, and I said it had to be equal to the VD set. Okay. Right? I mean, because that's it's, the yeah. drain of the map. Sounds about right. I can't guarantee that what so you I did. So you're off by 80 mil. I wouldn't be too concerned about that. I don't. I mean, there are other things at play. Like you're not going to be exact, but as long as you're close, I think that's fine. Okay. But I'm not the. I. I this is Sorab's homework, so I can only say that with a reasonable degree of confidence. Yeah, so they're in the, like, we haven't figured out a way to distribute homework, like, we tried distributing out homeworks, like, day of the section, like, I had homework threes here last week, and a lot weren't picked up, um, so I don't have them right now, because lugging them around would be too much of a pain. I guess what people have been doing, or what someone suggests, is that we use either 297 or 299, where I have my office hours. I think where Saurabh has his office hours as well. There's a bookshelf there where people just deposit old homeworks, and I think that's what we'll do. Bookshelf. Yeah. You know, what I'm, you know what room I'm talking about? Uh, yeah, the one we Yeah. Okay. I have a little quick question. Sure. Um, when you look at this point, it's just like comment, right? Mm-hmm. So when you look at full resistance, is that one over GM or it's all? It depends. It depends on how you're... you're if you're stimulating it in a common mode sense or a differential sense, if you're putting if you're putting just a test current here, then it's no longer balanced. So then this is RO. But if you're if you're also putting an identical test current there, then as you move this up, it's as you put more current in here and more current in here, this only moves GM one over GM. So it depends on how you stimulate it. So is that depends on whether here's output or there's output? Here is always the output. Only when you're talking about purely common mode drive. Okay. Once you put that test current there and you start twiddling it, it's no longer common mode. That's not a common mode drive. Okay. All right. Let's. All right. Back to it. Um, <coughs> questions. I'll actually. Well. Hold on a second. I'm actually going to go through a question that someone just asked me, but it was a very good question. And that is with, can we go down to the, thanks. So with this amplifier, <coughs> you know, the standard differential to single-ended amplifier that you see all the time. What, I, what I've said many times is that as you move, if you just apply a purely common mode drive here, that it looks as if this voltage is connected to here. Like this node is connected, there's, there's this imaginary connection, right? So the question was asked, well, so what's the output resistance at this point? And so is it 1 over GM or is it R out? And so you know, how, do you, how do you test what the output resistance is? you put a little test current source here, right? As soon as you do that, this is no longer different, this is no longer com being driven common mode, right? So now you have to look, this is being driven from one end, so you have to look at it solely as a differential mode thing, okay? And if you were to just use the small signal model and put it in yourself, that answer would fall out. However, if you happen to be applying a simultaneous in phase equal amplitude test current there, then all of a sudden, and you're, oops, well, I guess I have to make them pointing in the same way. Then all of a sudden, um, you know, it, it'll look like now that now the output resistance here, you know, which is defined as VO over IX, will equal 1 over GM2. Right? But the point is, is that you're doing something over here. Now you're actually driving it truly common mode. So it, it, it all depends on how you drive it. That's, that's the answer. And the thing to keep in mind is that when you're confused, if you 
put together, if you, if you write, draw out the small signal model, the small signal model does not lie. The small signal model will give you the answer. Everything that I'm showing here are shortcuts based on intuition, but ultimately the small signal model is the final arbiter of what the correct answer is. We will spend if, I mean, yeah, generally, because if you put a test current over here, then somehow it's like a a two terminal circuit. Well, I mean, but well, what does R out mean? R out means that you know you're treating it like an amplifier with some gain and then some R out. This node over here doesn't exist in this amplifier macro model. So you can't draw, you can't put it, you know, you can put a test current here, but this other one can't, there's nowhere to attach it to. So yeah. All right. Any other questions? Uh-huh. Well, I kind of did that, the, the, this, this cascode thing that I did, pretty similar it's just that it, it's missing some devices it doesn't have basically for a telescopic cascode at least it doesn't have uh, the tail current source here but other than that it's basically the same thing so I mean yeah I could do it again but it's the same basic process I'm sorry Sure, but I also figured out, like, the breakpoints are when, you know, M2 and, or M3 get crushed, right? Yeah. Those are the breakpoints, and I went through that analysis. And the thing to keep in mind, and I think what might be tripping you up, is the fact that all I did, I kept all these input voltages constant, and I just moved the output voltage, right? I didn't move the input voltage. The reason why I did that is, gets back to what I had said before. Um, these circuits have very high gain, right? on the order of 1,000, 10,000 or more. So therefore, when this thing moves, like this thing moves a volt, which is a lot, the input is moving 10 microvolts. Like 10 microvolts in the scheme of things isn't going to matter. So for all intents and purposes, you can keep these as constant and just move the output. Now there may be circuits where that's not the case. For instance, like where, where you can't assume that the only mo node moving is the output node. For instance, if you had a gain stage followed by a source follower, right? Because as this node moves up and down, since the gain through the stage is 1, that means this node is also moving up and down. And realistically, it's this move node moving up and down that causes that node to move up and down. And this node that moves up and down very, very little causes this node to go. So I kind of go backwards because I can. But re just so you understand, the causality of this is, is clearly in that direction, left to right. OK, anyone else? Push Paul? Have you handed in your homework? Has everyone handed in their homework? Yeah. Okay. Well, no, I just want to make sure that I don't sort of do the homework and then someone's furiously scribbling it down. And then in five minutes when I leave, someone says, oh, here's my homework for. Okay. So basically, I mean, this, is, this gets back to actually sort of what I had shown you before with that perfect class B amplifier. Do you remember that? All right, well, anyhow. So the circuit looked like this. I want to make sure I get this right. No, I didn't do that. Oops. This is a PMOS, right.
Why am I drawing this? That's what it should be. All right, so this is basically what the circuit looked like, okay? Granted, there actually was a mirror over here that set up this current source, but whatever. So the thing to keep in mind, so this is a PMOS. So IB. So basically, when, when, the volt, when this is set up such that this guy is zero volts, okay, how much current is flowing here? IB. How much current is flowing here? IB. IB. So, how much current is flowing in, let's call this M1 and this M2? How much current is flowing in M1? Why? And how much current is flowing in I2? M2? Yep, exactly. And that's because this sets up that bias such that in the quiescent point, you've got a little bit of current flowing in here. So in the previous example with a perfect class B, this is zero. Like there's no current flowing. Um, there's no current flowing through here. Okay. So now as this voltage goes up, okay, how much, so let's, let's assume that this is a 1K ohm resistor, say, this is a, and you're at plus one volt. So one milliamp is flowing in this direction. Okay? How much of that current is flowing through M1? Basically all of it. And through here is zero. This guy eventually turns off. And vice versa, right? So now what we can do is at least for the output stage portion, I'm not going to worry. Clearly in this leg, Oops. In this leg, IB is flowing the entire time. Okay? Yes. Not through M2? Very good question. And that's because, so, the most, what's that? Yeah, clearly this voltage has to go up, right? And it has to go up at least one volt, right? But it as so that means this is going up one volt as well. Realistically, however, <coughs> in order so so this goes up a volt, but it's also sourcing a lot more current in this direction. This guy clearly has to be sourcing at least one milliamp, right? So that means that VGS gets bigger. Okay. So if this goes up a lot, this goes up some, and this actually goes up by the same amount. So VGS of this guy is getting bigger. VGS of this guy is getting smaller. So this guy, that, this guy eventually just gets turned off. Okay? And you can figure out the math yourself. So, anyhow, so that being the case, let's look at I through M1. Well, let's, okay, so V out, what is V out going to look like over a period? It's going to look like that. As will I out. As, or via as will I load, excuse me. So now, with this guy, M1, what's the I through M1? So when, when I load goes positive, it does this, and when I load equals zero, this is at IB. And then it sort of tail as as I load goes negative, it kind of tails off and eventually turns off. So that's basically what I load looks I, I am one looks like. And I think that if you make the approximation that I am one is basically just looks like that, and forget about that extra IB stuff, 
you'll probably be fine in terms of calculating what the overall efficiency is, because otherwise calculating efficiency gets very difficult. So IM1 looks like that. IM2 looks like that. So in this leg here, the average current supplied by the source is basically equal to the average current sor sourced by M1. So it's basically this thing. You know, it's zero during half the period, and then um, this half sinusoid during half the period. And when you integrate that, so if this is A, what do you get? You get something like A over pi, something like that. That's the average value. Or maybe A over 2. I forget exactly, but you can. it's a very simple um, uh, equation to do. Very simple integral to do. And so that's how you get... That's how you get the current sourced by the power, and you add up this constant current stuff, and then you get the total current consumed, and you also and you can very easily calculate what the power delivered to the load is, and there's your efficiency. Okay. All right. That's about it. Um, keep your eyes posted to the news group. There will probably be some announcements about formal midterm reviews. Sure. All exam policy questions should be directed to Professor Broderson because real-world applications if you don't specify what kind of device you're using.